So uh, this morning, uh, before we, we get into the website, um, I just want to give some general announcements. But first, let me just uh, say once again, welcome to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. If you're here in person or if you're uh, watching via the live stream, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time this morning to come here and uh, to worship with us and to hear uh, the Word of God together. And if it's your first time visiting uh, via the live stream, uh, welcome. We are in El Paso, Texas, far west Texas. Um, we are a part of the state of Texas, um, and, and yes, we're here uh, together. If you're able to come visit us in person, we do want to invite you. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m., and of course, if you're here in person, we do want to know how you are doing. We have some white uh, cards in the back there where you can uh, write any praise reports, any prayer requests, and you can do that on the back of the card. You can put them in the agape box, or you can give those to us personally, and of course, if you need anything after service, you can come up. And certainly, uh, we're here to serve uh, one another. And um, if you're watching via the live stream, I do want to invite you to visit our website at um, fbccelp.com. And um, when you go to our website, um, it'll look something like this. Uh, if you go up to the site menu, there's just two areas I want to uh, show you here. So the website has a lot of information about the church. As you guys can see, our statement of faith. Um, a little uh, biography about Pastor Angel, uh, links to our, our media tabs, um, a contact us link. If you go to the media tab um, on the website, it'll take you to all of our past teachings that are available there on iTunes Podcasts, on SoundCloud, as well as our YouTube channel, uh, which I do want to encourage you all to subscribe to. Um, every study is loaded up there at the beginning of the week, typically, so you can go back and visit that study. And I do want to encourage you all to share the gospel by sharing these studies on your own personal uh, social media platforms. So if you go back to the home page there, and then once again to our site menu, uh, you want to get in contact with us during the week, you can click on that link there, um, and it'll take you to this electronic version of the, um, you know, that, that white postcard that's in the back if you're here in person, and you can fill this information out, your name, um, if you want to remain anonymous, that's cool as well. If you need any type of prayer, anything you want to share with the church, you want more information, you can fill that out there. And I think as you scroll a little bit further down, um, I think, yeah, here we go. We have our physical meeting and mailing address as well as our phone number and our email address if you want to get in contact with us uh, through those avenues. And then if you continue to scroll down, um, actually go up, I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, there's some links here to our social media. Um, I forgot to mention we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, Instagram, and then of course the YouTube uh, channel that I want to encourage you all to subscribe to. Um, we want a lot of likes. No, it's not that. We want to share the gospel. That's what it's all about, right? Here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, it's not a Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel thing. It's a Jesus Christ thing. And that's our, our heart, our purpose here. All right, so if you go back to um, our site menu, um, we don't have a formal offering here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. However, as the Lord leads you to give, we do have the agape box in the back of the room. And then if you want to give electronically, you can certainly do that online. There's that link there on the website through PayPal. And um, that PayPal link is actually linked to all of our social media platforms as well. So you can give through that avenue as the Lord leads you. And of course, the Lord loves um, a cheerful giver. That's between you um, and the Lord. All right, so uh, once again, the website, an, a great resource for information about our church and um, just some general announcements for the week. Uh, the men, we will be gathering on Wednesday at 6.30 here at the church, and uh, we're currently going through the book of Genesis. So if you're interested in attending, you can reach out to the church. We'll give you more information, or you can just come um, at 6.30 uh, here at the church on Hondo Path. And um, the, the youth group will be gathering once again after announcements. If you have um, any children, any, any young um, middle school, high school age kids um, that's keeping you from coming to church, just bring them with you. Uh, we do have a youth group. We're currently going to the Gospel of Luke. And um, we do meet right after announcements. And then we are planning a monthly um, outing before school starts. I think we have like two weeks to do that. So um, we'll do something very soon here before um, all, the, all the young people go back uh, to school. And then we also do have a children's ministry. If you have young children and that's also keeping you from coming to church, bring them with you. We have that right after the announcements um, in the back here. Okay. Um, 
I think that is all of the announcements for this morning. Once again, you want to, you want more information, reach out to us. We're here uh, to serve you, to serve our community. Thank you again uh, for being with us, for taking some time out of your day to hear this message. And if you're watching, I, I truly believe the Lord has uh, put you wherever you're at to watch this message for a reason. So um, I hope that he speaks to you powerfully and my, mightily and that you will be blessed by the message. So this morning, um, we are going to continue our study uh, again in Second Samuel. And today, um, we're going to be covering one chapter. And I've titled today's message, Building a Better House. And we'll be in Second Samuel chapter 7. Now, in the chapters, in the next few chapters that we're going to be covering during the next few weeks, we're going to be seeing involved in four important activities. This week, here in chapter 7, we're going to see him accepting God's will. Next week, in chapters 8 and 9, we're going to be looking at David fighting God's battles, bearing God's kindness. And then when we get to chapter 10, we're going to see him defending God's honor. However, these four activities were really nothing new to David. Because even before he became king, even before he was crowned the king over all of Israel, he had served the Lord and the people in these ways. So for him, wearing the crown and sitting on the throne didn't change him. It didn't change who he was. Because in his character and conduct, he had lived like a king all of his young life. Now, our, our text here in Second Samuel chapter 7 contains what theologians have come, up, come to call the Davidic Covenant. One of the greatest, one of the great covenants in the entire Bible. And many have said that, you know, this ranks up there as far as uh, some, of, some of the best, one of the best chapters in the entire Bible. So in today's message, we're going to explore the meaning and the significance of the Davidic, of this Davidic covenant to both, well, to David himself, to the nation of Israel, and to us as a church, God's chosen people, God's children, those who have been born again. And so again, as I mentioned, uh, you're going to be seeing in the story how, you know, it's God is building a better house. So before we get into Second Samuel chapter 7, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord God, we are so thankful. The worship is so wonderful and good, and we, we truly hope, Lord, and that you um, it was just pleasing unto you, Lord, for you. It was a sweet smelling aroma, and you enjoyed that, Lord. And so as we gather now together here in this church, Lord, and those watching, I pray that you will remove distraction, Lord. You move anything that might get in the way of you truly speaking to the hearts and minds of people. We dedicate this time. Keep us safe, Lord, and let us see what it is that you want to show us through these words. Do through your words. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray this thing. Amen. All right, Second Samuel chapter 7. And the word of God says, When the king had settled into his palace, and the Lord had given him rest, rest from every side, from all his enemies, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Look, I am living in a cedar house while the ark of God sits inside ten, tent curtains. So Nathan told the king, Go and do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. 
But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go to my servant David and say, This is what the Lord says. Are you to build me a house to dwell in? From the time I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until today, I have not dwelt in a house. Instead, I have been moving around with a tent as my dwelling. In all my journeys with all the Israelites, I have, have I ever spoken a word to one of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people? Who I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, asking, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So now this is what you are to say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of Armies says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, to be ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a great name for you like that of the great, greatest on, on the earth. I will designate a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evildoers will not continue to oppress them as they have done ever since the day I ordered the judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after your descendant. I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows for mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him, as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported all these words and this entire vision to David. Then King David went in, sat in the Lord's presence and said, Who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? What you have done so far was, was a little thing to you, Lord God. For you have also spoken about your servant's house in the distant future. And this is revelation for mankind, Lord God. And this is a revelation for mankind, Lord God. What more can David say to you? You know your servant, Lord God. Because of your word and according to your will, you have remembered all these great things to your servant. This is why you are great, Lord God. There is none like you, and there is no God besides you. As all we have heard confirms. And who is like your people, Israel? God came to in order to redeem a people for himself, to make a name for himself, and to perform for them great and awesome acts, driving out nations and their gods before your people, you redeemed for yourself from Egypt. You established your people, Israel, to be your own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, Lord God, fulfill the promise forever that you have made to your servant and his house. Do as you have promised, so that your name will be exalted forever when it is said, when it is said, the Lord of armies is God over Israel. The house of your servant David will be established before you, since you, Lord of armies, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant when you said, I will build a house for you. Therefore, your servant has found the courage to pray this prayer to you. Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now please bless your servant's house so that it will continue before you forever. For you, Lord God, have spoken with your blessing. With your blessing, your servant's house will be blessed forever. Now, back in the ancient world, uh, during this time, 
what kings and leaders did when they weren't fighting war, wars said a lot about what was really in their heart. Nebuchadnezzar, for example, surveyed the entire city of Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, boasted this, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence in my vast power and for my majestic glory? And then there's David's son, Solomon. When he wasn't fighting wars, the Bible tells us that he collected wealth and wives, entertained foreign guests, and wrote books. But it appears from these first three verses of this chapter that during David's downtime, he had the Lord on his mind and discussed with his chaplain, Nathan, ways to improve the spiritual condition of the kingdom of Israel. And so what this tells us that David wasn't just some simple ruler. He was a shepherd with a heart for his people and a sincere concern for their well-being. So again, what these verses, these first three verses point out, this, when things were calm and peaceful, he kept thinking of ways to make the nation better. And when he was successful, his mind was still on God and his goodness to him. Well, we learn throughout the rest of the chapter that God honored David's heart by revealing to him and Nathan what has been called the Davidic covenant. This declaration not only had great meaning for David in his day, but it also has significance for modern day Israel. The church the Christian church, and the world at large. So let me first begin by showing you what this covenant meant to David. Now, first of all, none of us should be surprised that David really wanted, he really wanted to build a house for the Lord. Why? Why shouldn't it surprise us? Because we know that he was a man after God's own heart. And because of that, he, he had a deep desire to honor him in every single possible way. During his years in exile, David vowed to the Lord, and read about this in Psalm 132, that he would build a temple for him. And as we read last week, he began to fulfill that vow when he brought that, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. But we now see that David, that it bothered David to know that while he was living in this palace, in this mansion that was built for him, while he was nice and comfortable there, the Ark of God was sitting inside tent curtains. And so we see in verse 2 that this bothered him so much that he shared this burden to the prophet Nathan. Now this is the first time that Nathan appears in the Bible. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 5, we saw that when David was in exile, Gad had been his prophet during that time. And so the question comes up, like, what happened to Gad? Why did Nathan all of a sudden appear? Well, when we get to chapter 24 of 2 Samuel, we're going to see that he's still in the picture. 
He's still around. And according to First Chronicles chapter 29 and Second Chronicles chapter 29, it appears that, that him and Nathan work together in keeping the official records and also just organizing worship. But now it seems at this point, in this particular point in, in our story, Nathan has now become the main prophetic voice of God to David during his reign. And when we get to chapter 12, we're going to see that it was Nathan who confronted David about his sin. And in 1 Kings chapter 1, he was also there to ensure that his son Solomon became king. But just to show you again how important Nathan was to David, First Chronicles chapter 3, it says that David had four sons with Bathsheba, and he named one of them Nathan. So, going back to our passage here, after David had shared this burden with Nathan, the prophet told the king, go and do all that is on your mind, for well, the Lord is with you. Here's the thing. When he said that, Nathan wasn't affirming that God's desires were aligned with God, what that David's desires were aligned with God's will. Rather, he was just encouraging the king to pursue his desires and see what the Lord wanted him to do. Well, you then see in verse 4 that God answered by giving Nathan a special, a special message to give to the king, in which he faithfully delivered. In the first part of that message, God reminded David that at no time had he ever asked any tribe or tribal leader to build him a house. In fact, God commanded Moses to make a tent for his dwelling because it satisfied him to travel with his people and uh, to be with them, to dwell with them, wherever they camped. So now that Israel was now, uh, Israel w and the land was, uh, had some peace, they needed a caring leader, not a temple. And that's what God had called David to be, a caring leader, a pastor, a shepherd. He reminded David that throughout his life, he had been with him, protected him, and made his name great. But in spite of his desires and his oath, his vow, the Lord was now making it clear to him that it wouldn't be him, it wouldn't be David that would build the temple. And so for now, the best thing he could do for the Lord was to continue shepherding the people and setting a godly example. I'm not sure, this must have really bummed David out. Man, I really wanted to build God a temple. I really wanted to honor you know, when you have a heart after, uh, after God, God's heart, you know, I, all you want to do is please the Lord. You want to do whatever it takes to please the Lord. So yeah, it must, this must have bummed them out. But nevertheless, he accepted what the Lord had said graciously and thanked the Lord for all the goodness he had showed him. And later in First Kings, Chapter 8, there it tells us that when Solomon de dedicated his temple, the temple, he explained that God had actually accepted David's desire for that deed. There it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 18, Since your heart was set on building a temple for my name, you have done well to have this desire. The lesson here is that if you desire to be a servant of God, then you must learn 
to accept the disappointments of life. Because the truth is that many times disappointments are his appointments. Many times when you don't get what you desire and you don't, it isn't happening for a good reason, for a good purpose. Again, he's in control, he's in charge, he knows what's happening. His appointments are his appointments. Well, next, in verses 10 through 16, we see that what this covenant meant to the nation of Israel. Foundation of God's purposes and dealings with the people of Israel is his covenant with Abraham. See, God chose Abraham by his grace and promised him a land, a great name, multiplied descendants, and his blessing and protection. He also promised that the whole world will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And now we know that this refers to Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself. Thus, God called Israel to be the human channel through which his son and his word would come to the world. Well, God's covenant with David builds on a covenant with Abraham, for it speaks about a nation, the land, and the Messiah. The Lord began with the subject of Israel's land and, and promised rest to his people. The word rest is an important wor word in the prophetic vocabulary and refers to a number of blessings in the plan of God for his people. This concept began with God's rest when he completed creation in Genesis chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, which then became the basis for Israel's observance of the Sabbath. Well, after God delivered Israel from Egypt, he promised them rest, in their own land. But at this point, at this particular time, David was so busy fighting wars that he just couldn't build the temple. Therefore, it wasn't time yet for that, for that rest. There wasn't time just yet for, for that rest that he was talking about. However, it eventually did come. See, Solomon built the temple during that time using the plans and materials that God gave his father David. But this concept of rest also goes beyond the, these matters because it also speaks, speaks of spiritual rest that believers have in Christ. Listen carefully to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And there Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly, lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Furthermore, this concept of, of rest also looks ahead to Israel's future kingdom and the rest that all of us believers will enjoy when Jesus Christ finally sits on David's throne as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're given a glimpse of that in Isaiah chapter 11, verse Beginning in, uh, beginning in verse 1, let me go there and read that to you. Isaiah chapter 11. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear, bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. 
His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute judge, judge justice by what he hears in his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute just, justice for the oppressed of the land. And he will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth. And he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze their young ones, and their young ones will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into the snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. Verse 10, On that day the root of Jesse, of Jesse will stand as a banner peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance and his resting place will be glorious. So you see it. That time, that's when we'll finally be at rest. Well, after this, the Lord turned his promises concerning the land and the nation the promises concerning David's throne and family. Now, for the most part, in general, every king, every president, every prime minister, every every main national leader that that has ever had that position, again, for the most part, is concerned about the future of their nation, the future of their kingdom, and. Here, the Lord promised something above and beyond anything he could have imagined. See, David wanted to build a temple. But God basically said, God said this, Thank you, David, but no thanks. Let me build you a better house instead. This was a greater promise than David's offer to God because David's house, his dynasty, would last longer and be more glorious than the temple that David wanted to build. God's first announcement of the coming of the Savior, again, was given in Genesis 3.15, where he informed uh, that a savior would be a human and not an angel. Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 tells us that he would be a Jew who would bless the whole world. And Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 said that he would come through the tribe of Judah. And in this covenant now that he's making with David, he announced to the king, he announced to David that the Messiah would come through his family. And later, the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he, he prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem, a city of David. So yeah, no wonder the king was elated. No wonder he was just so happy when he learned that the Messiah would be known as the son of David. In this section, the Lord speaks about Solomon as well as about the Savior, who Matthew 12.42 says is greater than Solomon. Yes, it would be Solomon who would build the temple that David longed to build, but his reign would end. However, the reign of the Messiah would go on forever. David would have a house 
forever, a kingdom forever, and a throne forever, and would glorify God's name forever. All of this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Son of David, and will be manifested when He returns, establishes the promised kingdom, and sits on David's throne. So thus, the spiritual blessing, blessings God offered to David are today offered in Jesus Christ to all who trust in Him. So now I want to explain what this Davidic covenant means to Christian believers today, to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, so far, I've explained these two things. We have a church today because God used David's family to bring the Savior into the world. And two, there's a future for Israel because God gave David a throne forever. Well, the way that David responded to this great word from God is a good example for us to follow now, today. See, he humbled himself before the Lord and at least ten times called himself a servant of God. Now, a servant usually stood at attention and waited for orders when his master appeared. He just wouldn't be sitting around doing nothing. He would stand any time the master came in the room, he would stand and wait to see what, the, what, his, what, uh, what his master wanted. But verse 18 says that David sat in the Lord's presence. And as he sat there, it becomes clear to him and to us who are reading this, that the covenant God gave to David was unconditional. And all David had to do was accept it and let God work. So like a little child speaking to a loving parent, the king then poured out his heart to the Lord. First, in verses 18 through 20, when he focused on the present, as he gave praise for the mercies God had bestowed on him, he realized that it was God's grace that brought him from the sheep pen to the throne. And now God has spoken about his descendants far into the future. In verses, again, 18 through 20 and 28 through 29, David addressed God as Lord God, which in Hebrew is Jehovah Adonai, a sovereign Lord. This tells us that only a God of sovereign grace would give such a covenant. And only a God with sovereign power could fulfill it. In the New Living Translation, verse 19 reads like this. Do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? Well, in a sense, in one sense, the answer is no. Because God chose the house of David to bring his son into the world. But in another sense, the answer is yes. Because any sinner can trust in Jesus Christ and be saved and enter the family of God. We read in verse 21 that David saw the promises of this covenant as the great things because of the dependability of God's word and God's love. Second in verses, second, in verses 22 to 20, 24, David looked at the past and God's amazing grace towards Israel. In this part of his prayer, 
He praises the Lord for choosing Israel instead of another nation on earth and for revealing himself to Israel by giving the law on Mount Sinai and speaking his word through the prophets, through his prophets. God did this so, so that the Jews would remember the uniqueness of the Lord and not bow before idols, the idols of other nations. And so what David is saying is that God had chosen Israel to be his people forever. Yes, even to this day, they're still his people. They're blinded right now. They got a, a veil that's keeping them from seeing the truth about the Messiah, but they're still his people. A third part of David's prayer and praise, which we see in verses 25 to 29, <coughs> and look to the future as God revealed the covenant that was just to that was just delivered to the king. God gave the word. David believed it. And David asked God to fulfill that word for his people. See, he wanted Israel to continue as a nation and for the Lord to be magnified throughout Israel. Now, even though David was probably again disappointed that he wasn't permitted to build the house for the Lord, he still asked God in verse 27 to fulfill his promise that he had made to him just previously in building his house, in building David's house. So if you look carefully, you'll see that your kingdom come is the thrust of verse 27. And your will be done is the thrust of verse 28. See, it wasn't enough to it wasn't enough for David to hear the promises and believe them. He also prayed to the Lord to fulfill them. He ends his prayer with not with petition, but with an assertion that his house will be blessed forever. David, David's prayer boldly ask God to do what he promised. Now, this wasn't a, a passive prayer that said, well, God, do whatever you want to do. I really don't care one way or another. This wasn't an arrogant prayer that said, well, God, let me tell you what you want to do. This was a bold prayer that said, God, Here's your promise. Now I trust you to fulfill it grandly and to, be, and to be faithful to your word. So here, David is basically saying, I'm only praying because you promised. You told me that this is what you want to do. Spurgeon put it this way. God sent the promise on purpose to be used. If I see a bank of a Bank of England note, which is a, a pound for us, it would be a Federal Reserve note, the dollar. Um, it's a promise for a certain amount of money, and I take it and use it. But oh, my friend, do try to use God's promises. Nothing pleases God better better than to see. His promises in circulation. He loves to see his children bring them up, bring them up to him and say, Lord, thou do as thou hast said. And let me tell you that it glorifies God to use his promises. Unquote. Again, I've got to be careful here. I'm not talking about the name it and claim it type of prayer. The kind of prayer that we're speaking about here appropriates God's promise, takes hold of it. It says, here, Lord, you said this. And again, two totally separate things, this theology of name and claim it and this. And I hope you 
can see what the difference is. But let me tell you this, Christian brothers and sisters. Through believing prayer like this, God promises that we appropriate. If we don't, if we don't appropriate in faith, God's promises are left unclaimed. Now again, let me give you a few examples as to not so I won't confuse you of what I mean. We may appropriate his promise for forgiveness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says there, if we confess our sins, he is, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We may appropriate his promise for peace. Jesus said in chapter four, uh, John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I live with, leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Or fearful. So you can take hold of that and say, Lord, you promised us. We may appropriate his promise for guidance. Psalm 32 8 says, I will instruct you and show you the way to go with my eye on you. I will give you counsel. We may appropriate his promise for growth. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it out onto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And finally, we may appropriate his promise for help. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says this, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I hope that you can see that in his humility, faith, submission, and submission to God's will, David is a good example for all believers to follow. Now before I and today, I want to give you some lessons that I given, shared some already, but let me give you some of these lessons that we can learn from this chapter. The first lesson we can learn is that even our highest, most noble ambitions and goals are flawed by sin. David's desire to build a house for God is so lofty that even Nathan is taken by, he's like, Oh, wow. You know, go ahead and go. The Lord is with you. Who could find fault for David for wanting to build God a glorious house? Well, God could. And he did. And the reason is that David's motives and his ambition fall short of what God intended. David seems to have become a little too caught up in his recent successes by his own position and power and even by the splendor of his own palace. God's response to David most certainly contains a rebuke to David's arrogance. Who are you to be building me a house? No matter how pious, your plans for God and his work may appear to be, they fall far short of the purity of thought and motive that God requires. In the final analysis, there's nothing we can do for God in our own strength. It is God who must accomplish great things through us and very often in spite of us. Related to this first lesson is yet a second lesson. No matter how high and lofty your goals and plans may be, God's plans are greater. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 36. And again, you may be familiar with this. 
Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And then it says, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, just as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Does David plan to build a house for God? David couldn't even imagine the house that God was going to build for him. God's house far surpasses David's proposed house. He's building him a better house. Third lesson, the greatest and glory, the greatest and glory of God's presence and power are not to be interpreted in light of how spectacular the surrounding setting and settings are. Long ago, Elijah was taught that God's present presence was not to be assumed in the midst of a spectacular of a spectacular phenomenon. Although, yes, sometimes he does employ the spectacular as we see in Exodus chapter 19 and 34, God was not present in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire. Where was he present? In a still, small voice. The disciples, to some extent, and the Jews in a large measure, expected the Messiah to be revealed by means of the miraculous and spectacular. And thus, the frequent demand for a sign. The Corinthians of the New Testament came to regard those with style and sensationalism as the most spiritual, while at the same time they came to despise those who were less spectacular, like Paul and the other true apostles. Our Lord himself did not come in a blaze of glory and sensationalism. He came with his glory revealed, and thus many failed to recognize him as the Messiah. The second temple was not really, was not nearly as spectacular, but in God's eyes, it was glorious. The true glory comes not from the external surroundings, but in the fact that God himself is among us, indwelling us, his body, church. We should learn from David and from others in the Bible that God's glory is to be found where God is present and not necessarily will we see the spectacular. Does David suppose that God will be more present in, spe in a spectacular temple than in the tent? Well, he's about to be reminded, though well, he is reminded, that God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. Now, God has chosen to dwell in a very different temple these days. It is a temple of his body, the church. In the eternal kingdom of God, there will be no temple. As, as, you know, as such as like, is being described here or in a building. For the Lord himself will be the temple. It says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The fourth lesson we can learn from this chapter is that, in this chapter is that David doesn't need a temple, temple nearby to worship his God. In fact, 
David is drifting away from worship when he proposes the construction of a temple. It isn't until after David, or it's after David has been reminded that all he is and all his and all he has accomplished is of God. And then, and that he begins to worship in the right manner. He then begins to acknowledge his own insignificance and to praise God for his greatness, power, and presence in his life. Church, fellow believer, this is where all true worship begins. Not in a spectacular building, but in focusing on the greatness and the grace of our God. Nowadays is a great deal of emphasis on planting and building the building of churches and great churches. Planting churches, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, it's a good thing. There's you know, we planted this church. This is nothing wrong with that. And and the building of large churches isn't necessarily evil. But here's the thing let us be on guard against the false assumption that the larger and more impressive buildings are, or the more or the larger they are and the more spectacular they look, that it's proof of God's presence and power. Just because there are thousands of people in the in a stadium type looking church doesn't necessarily mean that God's there, God's presence and power is there. We need to be on guard against prideful thoughts of our own contribution to the kingdom of God, of thinking that God really needs us. If it weren't for me, this wouldn't be ha- God wouldn't make this happen. We'd be on guard for those kind of thoughts. It's always He who will be carrying us rather than us carrying Him. How easy, how easy, easily we begin to focus on what we have done and what we can do for God rather than on all that He has done and will do through us. Fifth, David's, fifth, David's divine rebuke should serve as a lesson to every Christian. Have you ever thought to yourself, if you could ever grow up, ever gain maturity and wisdom as a Christian, you would somehow become exempt from temptation and be protected from sin? Well, friends, growth, maturity, and success Don't insulate us from sin. Often these things can become new temptations, can easily become new temptations for us to sin. David is in more danger in his palace than he was fleeing from Saul and hiding out in some cave. Too often we take our successes far too seriously We should be reminded that there is no success that we can honestly claim as our own. For every spiritual success is a gift of God's grace. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it. Why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Finally, it's important to remind you again of the greatest blessing of our lives aren't the result of our labors, but always the result of God's word, work. And often, as he uses our failings and shortcomings, David is rebuked for requesting to build God a temple. And yet, out of this request, God promises to build a house far greater than David could ever imagine. David is wrong when he commits adultery 
with Bathsheba and kills her husband. But in spite of this, she becomes David's wife and the mother of Solomon, the next king of Israel. David is wrong to number Israel, but as a result of that sin, the property on which the temple is to be built is was uh, is procured is is obtained by David. So you see what a wonderful and awesome God we serve cannot thwart his purposes and promises. And even if our efforts thwart his promises, uh, thwart his purposes, only uh, if we were to thwart his purposes, it only it will only serve to advance his kingdom. Oh, let me repeat that. If our efforts to thwart his purposes only serve to advance his kingdom, so let us rejoice. Let us be glad that God no longer dwells within a tent or in a temple, but the Lord Jesus, but in the Lord Jesus Christ and his body, the church. Here, God's house. You are God's house. The church again is God's house if you've trusted in Christ Jesus. So if you haven't done that today, if you haven't trusted in the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't surrendered your life to him, and you want to make him, if you want to allow him to come and make his uh, your heart his, his dwelling place, he wants to live in that temple. You just have to allow him. If that's what you want to do. Today is the day. Don't wait another day. Come to the cross and ask him to forgive you your sins, and he will. And he will wipe them all away, all past, present, and future sins. He will wipe them away, never to be remembered anymore. So that when you come face to face with him, you will be white as snow. All because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for you. So if you're ready for your sins to be forgiven, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head wherever you may be. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And so now I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name. If you pray that a couple of things. First of all, there's a celebration in heaven going on. And you want to reach out to us. To let us know that you prayed that prayer and it probably will help maybe help you uh, in the next steps of your new Christian walk. But don't just pray that prayer and you know forget about it. You no. Know, again, the Lord there's still a long road ahead. I can show you some wonderful and amazing things. And let us help you with that. If you're here in El Paso, you know, our door is here in the Northeast, always open to you. We want you to, you know, if you're around and want to come visit us and check us out, again, we're in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Visit our website if you want more information on that. But, uh, that'll conclude with today's message. Um, wow, this Davidic, I hope that you were able to see that this 
Davidic covenant, why it's so important, why it was necessary, what it means to us as believers. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great week. Goodbye and farewell.